E-commerce is not a new industry, but it's creating a new economic model that allows for transactions any time and any place. Fundamentally, this has become the largest change in the supply chain, chain our country has ever seen. The effects is to job training, infrastructure, transportation, industrial and retail real estate, as well as local government is enormous. This panel will be led by fellow Alliance board member Jim Ford. And Jim is the managing partner of Tress LLC, which is an Illinois-based real estate development and consulting firm. Prior to this, he was a partner at Centerpoint Properties Trust. He understands how e-commerce has become a real game changer. Jim, we look forward to learning how to best position the mega region to respond to the needs created by e-commerce and, and seize the opportunities presented by 24-7 worldwide consumers and businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Ford, who will moderate our panel on the effects of e-commerce. This is great, Kelly. We're actually a few minutes ahead of schedule. I, I kind of like this, so. Um, well, thank you for having me today. I, I, I'm very fortunate to, uh, uh, I grew up in a transportation family. My, my dad was in the trucking industry, my grandfather, my uncles uh, were in the railroads. Uh, so it was kind of inherently in my blood to, uh, to understand the effect on supply chain logistics and, and what it meant uh, when I was uh, uh, in college in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, in fact, I had a couple buddies who, uh, who were uh, getting degrees in uh, either logistics or transportation, and a lot of people would question them and say, well, why? I mean, you know, we were still at that point at the, at the good end of, of, of a manufacturing uh, type, type uh, uh, mentality in the U.S., and uh, I saw, because of what my family was involved with, kind of the effects of where globalization and uh, offshore manufacturing uh, was, was becoming an evolution in the supply chain and what we dealt with in the U.S. in general uh, from all forms of transportation. And when that was occurring, uh, I think some people I was very envious of were, uh, were, were uh, forward-thinking enough to, to, to realize that maybe getting a degree or, or getting experience in really supply chain and management of goods was going to be a positive thing in their future for their careers. Uh, and from there, getting out of school, uh, in fact, my dad thought I was, I'm one of four boys, and my dad thought I'd be the, the, the one son in the middle that actually would follow in his footsteps and get into the transportation business. And as much as I love his father, my father uh, retired down in Florida years back now, and, and I was with him this weekend at a wedding. Uh, I love him to death, but I'm thankful that I didn't because he would have uh, probably killed me along the way. Uh, uh, in, in his demands as, as a businessman, but that's it's a positive thing, and he was always fair and, and good to people. Um, but it's even fun now, and my dad is in his late 70s asking me questions all the time about evolution supply chain, what's the next trend, what's the next occurrence. Uh, and I was talking to Kelly earlier this year about this panel or, or what type of panels, what issues we should, we should address in the summit, uh, and she had just posed a question to me uh, about e-commerce and its effects. Uh, on supply chain in, in many different aspects, and I thought it was a great, great opportunity to bring some uh, some good friends and new friends, old friends and new friends together uh, uh, to give their perspectives on on what's really e-commerce, and, and we all deal with it now. And um, I know I've become guilty of becoming a, a, a an e-commerce shopper uh, with with many retailers or, or, or groups in general. Uh, uh, but uh, you know what's what, what's really been that effect in, in many different aspects from a governmental perspective, from a job perspective, from a real estate perspective, which is really a lot of my background uh, for the past 25 years of, of doing a lot of distribution logistics. Um, and, and really, what does it mean to, to us as consumers? And as I thought about the different uh, uh, people we might want to invite to the panel, I was so fortunate and lucky to get three different perspectives, uh, which really uh, ultimately are seamless in nature, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but able to get three people for the panel uh, that, I, that I've uh, dealt with in the past uh, that give independent perspectives. And, and, and the first uh, uh, that, I, that we were able to, uh, uh, to get to join us today is the Honorable John Nowak. Uh, John's been the mayor in Romeoville, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago for all these who don't know, Out 55, which is kind of our mecca of, of distribution uh, here uh, in the Chicagoland area. And um, John has been the mayor for, uh, for over eight years now uh, in, in, in Romeoville, and we've crossed paths in my past lives. Uh, so we're very honored to have John here. 
Um, and, and what I'm going to do is kind of give a quick, quick introduction of, of the three panelists and then allow each one of them a few minutes to talk about not only their, their, their lives in general, but kind of their view on e-com and what it's, what, what it's affected. And then we'll get to some questions and then, of course, open it up because I'm sure that uh, a lot of folks in the, in the audience might have some questions in general. Um, but then secondly, uh, very honored to have uh, Frank Unick, who is the CFO of Uline. Uline, and, and the reason why I was very happy to have uh, Frank join us, Uline uh, is, is a family-owned uh, packaging company, is I guess the really simplest way to think of how they started. But the greatness about Uline and the perspective that Frank's going to share with us is that they're in the packaging business, and if I go on Amazon or Walmart.com or whatever it might be, and I get a package delivered to my door 24 hours later, uh, I, can, uh, I can guarantee that uh, the, the, the odds or potential of it being in a Uline box uh, and my, my father's in the corrugated box business, so I know it well, but a Uline box uh, to your door or delivered uh, is, is, is good and high. That's you know, kind of one of the core businesses in the packaging industry. But also understand is that Uline has also really become almost an e-com retailer. I get a, a Uline book sent to my, or to my business, I should say, uh, every year, but I can go online and order stuff e-commerce from Uline that I might need in, in my, you know, business, which is, which is kind of separate. So you've got the perspective of them being an e-com company, as well as the perspective of them being a supplier to some of the largest e-commerce retailers or, or distributors in the country. Uh, and then thirdly, near and dear to my heart, because when, uh, when I told my father uh, 27 years ago I didn't want to get in the trucking business, I got into real estate, and that was uh, all logistics, transportation, distribution. Uh, and I'm very, we're very fortunate to have an old friend of mine, uh, Matt Powers here. Matt is the Executive Vice President uh, of Retail and E-Commerce with Jones Langle Sale, who, as a lot of you know, is, is the largest real estate company in the world, I believe, or top right up there. Some might argue that, but I believe that they're the largest. Um, and, and Matt and I have been friends for years. Matt came recently to Jones Langle Sale uh, from Walmart, and Matt was the head of... Uh, uh, one of the heads of, of really their distribution network at Walmart. Uh, and in, in his time at Walmart, uh, he managed, you know, over their 100 and f almost 50 million square feet in their portfolio was, was a major part of that management. Uh, he he uh, transacted over 20 million square feet of deals himself. But in my business life, in Matt's business life, before he came to Jones Lang, he actually was in charge, one of the senior people in charge, of creating a new building distribution real estate network for specific to Walmart's e-com business. So if I, if, if I have the, the most fresh approach from that perspective, I'm thankful to have Matt here today uh, to talk about his experiences from there. Uh, and with that, at this point, I would love, and we, we had a call the other day and, and, and talked to uh, uh, very openly, but I'd love for, uh, for, uh, for uh, Mayor Nog to start and kind of give a little of his perspective on e-com, what it's meant to him. He recently has done uh, in his village uh, which is a huge, you know, industrial city, a big part of their economy. Uh, but he's recently done some e-commerce deals, and we'd love to get some of his thoughts and perspective on what it means from a governmental perspective or viewpoint uh, of how e-commerce has, has affected uh, their village in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to just uh, begin by uh, thanking the organizers, the Fed and the Alliance, for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Uh, a lot of uh, individuals I've worked with in the past in the crowd. It's good to see everyone here today. Uh, for those who uh, may not be as familiar with our community, uh, we, as you mentioned, we are on the I-55 sub-corridor. Uh, for those in the industry, uh, you're probably sure you've heard of the I-55 sub-corridor. Uh, you know, our community of a population of nearly 40,000 actually has uh, nearly 30 million square feet of industrial space alone and growing every year. We'll, we'll, we'll add on about 2 million square feet this year uh, and probably in law likelihood nearly that again next year. Uh, so the pace has continued to quicken. You know, one of the interesting things about our area and Northern Will County as a whole is that uh, we've never had a year, even through coming out of the recession, that we haven't had a net job gain or growth year. Uh, I don't know that everybody knows that story. Uh, so uh, 
uh, it, we're in an interesting situation in an interesting area, and it's not only our community, but many of our neighbors and throughout our, our, our immediate region. Uh, I have been the mayor, as I said, for a number of years now. I also have the good fortune of sitting on the CMAP board. You know, as we talk about these topics today, one of the things I will pitch for that organization as well uh, is this is one of the topics you know, as we talk about the changing economy, uh, that especially the changes in e-commerce and what that is going to mean not only to our individual communities but the region as a whole and how uh, that's going to work out. And I think a lot of topics we talk here today and discuss really tie into that, that research and, and those discussions we're having at, at that level as well. You know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we, are, we just recently uh, uh, closed on and uh, have now operational a uh, Amazon facility, a uh, 780,000 square foot facility in an existing building, and uh, which is actually a bulk uh, facility. We're the bulk site in Illinois for Amazon. And, but, you know, as we were discussing this topic on our uh, call the other day, one of the things I, I emphasized is e-commerce really is in many sizes. Yes, the big dominant players take up a lot of the attention in the press, uh, but we have seen this beginning for a number of years already, uh, even in smaller e-commerce players in, in a w wide range of industries. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example. We actually had a uh, auto dealer, a small operational specialty auto dealer, uh, take up an industrial facility for all online sales. Uh, and they house every piece of uh, everything they sell inside the building. None of it's outside. They don't have people come and shop. But they are the point of sale, and they are, all their sales are done for specialty auto sales, all completely from one site in our community. So e-commerce for us has taken on many different aspects. Uh, and I want us to talk about uh, uh, facilities in a number of different ways. You know, we've seen a lot of hybrid evolution, too, in the marketplace in, in relation to, to e-commerce, where we now see logistics operation, e-commerce operations, traditional bricks and mortar and regional offices blended into facilities. Uh, so and this con the pace is continuing to grow, it's continuing to quicken uh, in the evolution of, of this industry. You know, we talk about uh, a lot of the things that we face, you know, as we look at e-commerce, obviously infrastructure is a major component into uh, the site selection and what happens with, and when we're talking especially the larger e-commerce and even the smaller e-commerce operators, uh, transportation without a doubt uh, continues to be. And that's one of the driving forces for our region uh, has always been logistics and our, our proximity to major interstates, the waterways, the rail system. System, uh, you know, even our re relatively re reasonable proximity to the airport system uh, in the region has always been a strength for us, uh, and, and continues to be. But also for these e-commerce, uh, you know, co-location, depending on the size of the of the of the e-commerce uh, retailer, to other delivery service. You know, one of the things that we had open up and not too too long ago was a major FedEx facility as well. Uh, UPS opening another facility, one of our neighbors in the near future. So these things are interrelated and continue to drive other development. And also our proximity to the supply chain. Uh, so some, many of their, 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 their provide, those who provide them with the goods that they then uh, sell through, the, through their sites. Uh, also availability of sites, uh, without a doubt. Uh, one of the reasons we were able to acquire the Amazon fac uh, facility that we did was the availability of a site that met their needs. Uh, we're seeing major e-commerce retailers build from the ground up. We're also seeing them acquire and do major renovations on existing sites. One of the things I say as a community um, that in other communities as a best practice, if we talk about some of the things that you need to be conscious of in, in e-commerce is their need to be operational in their time frame. Uh, you know, one of the key factors for us in our Amazon deal was getting them operational as quickly as possible so they were operational for, and even though it was an existing building, that's a substantial build out and conversion on the building. Uh, so your ability to do that and work with them and get that turnaround and your willingness to work with them and be flexible on their needs, because uh, their needs are different than, than some of the traditional uh, operations that may be in these buildings. 
Uh, availability workforce. Uh, and, you know, and before I leave infrastructure too, one of the other things that I think is key in we as, we as communities and, and regional planning and, and being positioning ourselves for to be competitive into the into the future economy as e-commerce continues to grow, is and I see some of, some representatives from some of these utilities is you, uh, here in the today is your availability of simple things like you know. Power, you know, your, your power load in a particular part of your community and the availability on these buildings. Many buildings weren't built with the idea of having e-commerce in that area or large concentrations of e-commerce. You know, one of the things we've also seen is a growth of in manufacturing or packaging. Uh, those things require larger amounts of energy. Uh, so all of that ties into the ability of these facilities to house e-commerce. You know, one of the other things on infrastructure too is on these sites is, E-commerce tends to have larger workforces. You need more employee parking. You have higher turnovers in deliveries, especially as more e-commerce uh, provides more of its own delivery and same-day delivery and uh, you know, even within a few hours. So you're, the infrastructure, the way you look at infrastructure is not the, and logistics is not the way we used to. Large semis going in and out of facilities aren't the only thing occurring. Now we're looking at smaller vehicles making more frequent trips large turnovers of 24 hour worker operations versus one shift or two shifts. So, you know, it's very common in our community to have three shifts. And that goes to also the issue of workforce. I know we talked about that and definitely as well in availability workforce. You know, as we were talking in our conversation the other day, uh, I don't know, that, and I said it then, then I'll say it again, um, and it's true, is I don't know that we were ready for this explosion of e-commerce, uh, but we need to be and when it comes to the workforce. And I think we're, we're all as a region trying to figure out what that means. You know, it's changing the dynamics of uh, w even the rates of pay, it's changing the availability. Uh, you know, we're having to work with PACE and other groups to bus people in to our community today versus, you know, coming out of the recession, we are a net job generator. And we, today we have probably well over a thousand jobs we could fill today if we had the workforce to fill them. Um, and, and that leads me to you know some of the other things is creating a, a business fit, uh, friendly environment, and that goes in many different ways, um, especially with e-commerce. You know, one of the things we, we we've started getting into is, you know, with this workforce issue, is does the community itself start getting more aggressive in marketing and helping them to find uh, a, a, you know more of a workforce in a broader area, uh, starting to host our own. Uh, job fairs for these, these retailers, not just their own efforts, uh, marketing, starting to do advertising campaigns in order to be a partner with them to make sure that they're, they're con constantly getting the workforce needs they need. So all these things are becoming a part of it. Um, you know, as e-commerce e e definitely is changing what communities have to plan for in the future. Traditional retail is not the go-to that it used to be. It can't be counted on for the revenue that it once did. There are smaller footprints. The amount of revenue is not growing at the rate that it might have. You might have looked at in the future. Um, you know, there was a time when communities, everything they wanted to do was driven by going to, you know, ICSC and getting retailers, and that was everything everybody wanted to do. Uh, and I think we're on kind of, we, we made an early decision to get more aggressive on e-commerce and hybrid facilities because that's where we're going. And, you know, what that means is do we now have industrial facilities that create retail sales tax? And as communities, as we look at our budgets, this is incredibly important uh, as we continue to talk about and continue to have this dialogue of point of sale, what that means. But again, it goes back to creating friendly environments that understand that e-commerce isn't as simple uh, to understand what that point of sale may be versus traditional retail and being open to that and how to work with those e-commerce e retailers to make sure that they're competitive in the marketplace as well while providing the revenue streams that the, the communities need to provide them with the infrastructure that they need. So a lot of different factors that are coming into play at the same time, uh, you know, I, I talk about the days where it was all about going to retail conferences and seeking out retailers. We've already made the decision. Now we go to the, and, and are per, going to boost to, and the, the best practice for those communities that aren't doing it, and I hate to give away our best secrets, but <laughs> uh, is to go to the Internet Retailers Conference and get a booth there. Start soliciting them. Um, they are the future. 
and they're going to be continue to be a bigger and growing segment of our economy. And whether it's providing jobs, it's taking up your traditional uh, warehouses and logistics facilities, or it's providing you with a potential growth area for new retail sales tax, it's something that communities need to be open to and think about. I know many of my colleagues in many communities still have not thought about this. They look at big warehouses and they think, well, that doesn't provide you any other revenue. Well, it, it, today it does. And that's what we're here talking about today. I mean, the reality is that e-commerce is changing that game completely. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in to a lesser degree, and I know a lot of our emphasis is on the bigger facilities here today, but you know, I was looking at conversions of existing facilities. Uh, you, know, you may have, and we've already heard and we've talked about in large degree, how some of the traditional retailers may convert and will continue to look at conversions of larger. You know, we have you know, retailers with well over 100, 150,000 square foot facilities for retail. Those can easily be converted into hybrid e-commerce hubs. And that's going to be something that communities need to be open to, need to rethink their zoning, their, their philosophies, and how to adapt to that uh, as we continue to go forward. So just a few things. I don't want to take too much more time because I know we want to talk and get some questions from everybody. So uh, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, skip over Matt because Matt's my buddy. I'm going to pick him at the end. Okay. Um, and uh, ask Frank to tell us a little bit about, you know, as I said, kind of a dual perspective on both not only being uh, a supplier to the e-commerce industry in, in their core business, but also really being an e-com company in general. Frank? Good. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I enjoy being here, and I really enjoy talking about Uline. We are 36 years old, private family-owned, family-run, still run by Generation One, Liz and Dick Uline, the founders. And we are headquartered up in Pleasant Prairie, just over the border from Illinois, just barely inside Wisconsin. This has been our world headquarters for since we've been founded here in this area. We've enjoyed being here. We've grown here. We've been very fortunate to have rapid organic growth. We've never done an acquisition, but we've continually had double-digit organic growth. We are private, so I won't share a lot of financial information, but we are a multinational, multi-billion dollar company. And as the mayor said, we too are building some pretty large boxes that perhaps you've seen. Our standard building size is over a million square foot building. Right now up in Pleasant Prairie, we've got one building at 1.1 million square feet, another right next to it at 1.2 million square feet. And Jim mentioned it, but you know we started 36 years ago, well before the internet and this proliferation of online ordering. So we didn't see it coming, we didn't forecast it, we didn't have a crystal ball, but yes, we've sure benefited from it because we're probably the world's most unsexy company. Jim mentioned our catalog. <laughs> you probably have this jammed into your mailbox far too often. And believe it or not, in this world of the web and online ordering, this standard old school catalog still works like a charm. We put it in somebody's mailbox or send it to your business and you do place orders. But it's about 800 pages now and it's very generic. It's boxes, it's tape. It's bags, and yes, we've scooted into some ancillary categories like material handling and janitorial and safety, but our foundation is still <laughs> pretty unsexy, pretty generic, boxes, tapes, bags, things that you will need if you're making something or shipping something that it serves right into our wheelhouse. And so certainly the proliferation of the web ordering has favorably impacted our business but it has certainly created some challenges. I'm sure many of you see these and feel these on a daily basis. And I'll state the obvious, but the conversation sure has changed, hasn't it? Where I as a consumer, you as a consumer, now we're placing orders on a Saturday afternoon and we're wondering, are we going to get it on a Saturday evening? Or at the latest, we better get it on a Sunday or we're gonna be really upset. And so for us in, the, in that environment, it's no longer can I ship this in a few days and get it to you this week. It's I have to have it in stock. I have to pick, pack, and ship it today. And I've got to try to get it to you today or at the latest tomorrow. 
So the mayor mentioned it, but you see all these big boxes. We're building big million square foot plus boxes all throughout uh, this country and others. And you just have to have the inventory in stock, ready, available, in a close geographical proximity to your customers. That's pushing out the walls of these buildings and requiring a lot of bigger buildings. It's requiring a lot of space available. Do you have shovel-ready sites in your community? You know, the mayor mentioned shovel-ready sites in his community. We ended up in Pleasant Prairie because of a proliferation of shovel-ready sites in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. We were able to get up there. It was a streamlined process. The mayor mentioned working together quickly, a business-friendly environment. We've certainly been fortunate in our growth to experience that, not just here in this area, but in other areas as well. But I think this area does it particularly well. We've been very fortunate to lock in arms with our friends in government and get things happening quickly. So the challenge on big buildings has certainly been there. That also then, of course, puts pressure on technology. If you're running a million two square foot warehouse, can you find the inventory? Do you have a good WMS system? Do you have good technology and good equipment and good processes to find it, pick it, pack it, ship it very quickly? So there's just, in our space, even though it's pretty unsexy, there's just this tremendous focus on technology and every little minor tweak and improvement, bless you, can kind of tweak it and make it go a little bit faster, get it to you one hour sooner, one hour sooner, one hour sooner. And really, we feel like our conversation now is, how can I ship to you a couple minutes faster today than yesterday? Because you're really demanding it. I'm demanding it as a consumer. So that's been a pressure we felt also. Workforce, sure, workforce is always a challenge. Some use part-time. We tend not to do that, a seasonal workforce. We tend not to do that. We don't have much seasonality in our business. But again, the mayor touched on this. What has really changed for us, we now have to staff up these big buildings 24-7. I'm sure, again, many of you experience this too. But you're calling at 8 o'clock at night. It's not sufficient to say, I'll take, I'll pick, I'll pack, I'll ship this order when I get in tomorrow. So our buildings are fully staffed 24-7. The light does not go off. There isn't a time where the building is empty. And that dynamic has really changed. And it sounds easier than it is trying to find great workers who are very willing to come in at midnight and do great things. That's not an easy shift. It's not an easy shift to staff, especially if there are daytime shifts available in the community. So we've certainly felt that as well. And again, I'll open to questions afterwards. I don't want to take up too much of the forum here, but we've enjoyed a fantastic 36-year ride at Uline. We've benefited from this e-commerce boom, but it has certainly created challenges for us, too. We're focused on technology. We're focused on staffing. We're fo focused, of course, on omni-channel, as I think most companies are these days. However you want to do business with us, we'll, we'll do it. You want to pull out your iPhone, that, that works with us. You want to call our call centers, which are staffed 24-7, 365, that's cool, too. However you want to interface with us, we'll make it happen. And the dialogue really has become minutes. How can we take that order you were kind enough to place with us and have it out the door within minutes, not days? Thank you, Frank. Uh, and lastly, uh, Matt, some thoughts? Well, uh, thanks, everybody, for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with the mayor and Frank and, and Jim. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so as Jim mentioned, I'm, I'm helping uh, lead up JLL's retail and e-commerce uh, platform. It's really to provide insight to address what the mayor and Frank have been talking about, just that uh, evolving customer expectation. You know, what is the customer expectation? It's to be able to order anything from any, any location, from your laptop, from your iPhone, from your, um, you know, from your uh, home computer, or just go back into the store. Uh, Retailers have to be ready for that in, in every facet that the, they're approaching things. Um, I'm hoping to be able to help bridge that gap. As, as Jim mentioned, uh, I was part of the, the Walmart rollout of their e-commerce network. And uh, just uh, rewinding the clock just five years ago, 
if you looked at where Amazon was with its fulfillment center network, probably 70 to 90 different facilities, however you want to define what a true fulfillment center network is, <clears throat> Walmart had one designated facil facility to e-commerce in 2012. Just one facility. Now, they were trying to leverage their network within their existing regional, traditional DC network, but um, they quickly realized that uh, Amazon was passing them by. If, if you look at the numbers now, Amazon's revenue or, or sales is, is a, over a hundred billion. Who's number two? Walmart. And where's Walmart? 13, 14 billion. So there's a huge gap. And you look at that and you think, well, Walmart's that far back, where are the other retailers? And, and you're seeing uh, many retailers kind of wake up. They, they, they sat on their hands probably far too long and, and, and things are passing them by. So you're seeing a, a huge reaction. You, you've seen store closures with uh, Walmart, with Macy's, uh, 100 stores just uh, two quarters ago uh, that they announced. Office Depot, Depot, Radio Shack, traditional successful retailers are changing their footprint. And why are they doing this? They're gonna be able to redirect that capital into focusing on e-commerce. Uh, and, and really, if you think about it, if this were five years ago, were these stores underperforming so much that they would have been closed? Probably not. You know, the, definitely the, the retailers were uh, good stewards of the company to analyze what stores should be closed. But at the same time, they were probably hurdling. They were meeting the ROI that they needed to meet just a few years ago. But the fact is, retailers have to redesign their entire systems for e-commerce. They have to integrate their internal retail, uh, you know, brick and mortar uh, retail system to, to talk seamlessly, you know, with their internet, with their website. And uh, that's, that's going to cost some money. And so that's just a little bit of the behind the scenes around that. Uh, as far as Walmart's rollout, uh, again, I, I believe they, they waited too long, but finally w when the, the decision was made, uh, I worked on a five-node network, and so that five-node dealt with uh, reaching 95% of the population within two days. And so where that would be is you're looking at L.A., you're looking here in the Chicago, greater Chicago area, Dallas-Fort Worth, Atlanta, and New York City. So if you can get around each of those areas, you, you basically deliver to 95% of the population within two days. Um, there's still a lot of growth around that. I mean, and, and so again, Walmart's addressed that. Some others like Home Depot, Target, they're, they're more aggressive as well, but a lot of re retailers are still in their infancy. As we're seeing retail diminish to some degree, and, and, and I'll give you a number, um, we saw an 18% increase year over year in retail sales. How that was made up is it was 15%. 15% of that was e-commerce sales. Only two and a half, three percent was from true br brick and mortar. So that's where the change is going, and and I think you're only going to see that grow uh, as as time goes by. Thank you, Matt. In fact, that I was teasing earlier about Matt going last because because I've got a couple questions for 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 the panel, and 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 knowing all three gentlemen as individuals. They're all very well versed, way more than I am, in, in, in answering some of these general questions. But one, and Matt kind of addressed it, is of concern is, you know, he had mentioned Macy's as an example, closing down all these stores, right? Sports Authority went BK, and 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 I honestly am not, I'm the, probably the dumbest guy in the room, but but the reality is, what would have happened if, if they'd been ahead of the curve with ecom? Would they've been in the position they were? to go bankrupt, but think about that was 260 stores, right, nationwide or something that, that, that are closed down. Um, Kmart Sears has scaled back, Ralph Lauren scaled back. I just saw an, an, another one, was it Kenneth Cole? There was somebody recently, just in the past couple of days, a, 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 a apparel manufacturer um, who said they're closing down a bunch of stores. Golfsmith, I'm an avid golfer, is, is just closing down all their stores in Chicago and, and across the country are scaled back. So my, my question to Matt, and, and, and believe me to Mayor Frank as well, because we're all versed in it, uh, is from a retail store real estate perspective, and that affects all of us. You know, you think about going back to the, the regional mall where you had a Sears or, or you know, whatever uh, larger retailers and Nordstrom's, I mean, some of these larger guys, Macy's, you know, Marshall Fields back then would be kind of an anchor of a big mall and then a lot of surrounding, you know, 
properties around it. Uh, or, and then it became more of a lifestyle type center and then it became freestanding type stores. But what ultimately from a retail real estate perspective can we envision as potential you know, reuses as a lot of these retail type locations are closing is becoming an e-commerce world? Oh, if I might, yeah, I'll start real quick. It's, it's, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned too uh, Sports Authority and, and they're closing. We actually had their distribution facility, so it's kind of interesting for us. We didn't actually have one of their retail stores. That, fortunately for us, though, that that facility was those facilities are in such demand that uh, actually Room Place ended up taking it, which is, uh, brings me to a, a, a interesting part of this conversation of, of retailers. You know, I talked about these hybrid facilities as well, and I, we're seeing more and more of this. You know, we had to actually uh, open up a new new generation of stores uh, that does do e-commerce. It does re- it does the fulfillment or fulfillment for their uh, store sales through about twenty six stores throughout the region. But the interesting part about it is that they added sixty thousand square feet of traditional retail in a four hundred and sixty thousand square foot building, um, plus their regional offices. And what we've found from them, and I won't give away all their sales numbers, but I'm just go out on a limb and say that 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 on site is does as well as any of their other stores. But people like the concept of being able to order. It goes back to being having all your choices in one place, and that combination and this evolution of how do we maximize our space. So if we're going to take a half a million square foot building as a retailer for our distribution, can we get? extra usage out of this? Can we get office space? Can we get, and as municipalities, you know, you need to rethink the way that you plan your zoning, your, you, know, you plan your communities to accommodate that as well. Um, you know, one of the one of the ones I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in reuse is, is really, it's very difficult, especially, I'm sure they'll tell the same thing. You know, you look at a facility, users in a, I'll say from maybe 20, 30,000, maybe 30,000 at least, up through to probably at least 100,000 square feet, they're just, they don't exist. Um, so, the, you know, you're, you're often have times having to break up facilities uh, into smaller units, look at entertainment, different, you know, maybe residential components that would not traditionally have been part of your original makeup. Uh, you know, and I, a little story I'll tell, too, uh, about my favorite retailer that is growing, uh, and it's from the region, uh, which we just opened a new store, a new prototype store for them, and it goes back to this conversation. Uh, we just opened a new farm and fleet store whole new generation of stores for this company. Now, everybody in the room, those who may or may not have been to a farm and fleet, uh, great company, uh, based out of Wisconsin, and we're very happy to have them invest in our community and pick us as the new prototype for their, new, their stores. Now, we're, we'll be the, we're the 37th store, they had 30 other, six other stores, but this whole new generation. But one of the major things in planning for that was how do we integrate and the layout of our store goes back to Sales off of applic- you know, a phone application or you know web-based orders, and that's a major component of this new retail thing or establishment is to be a part of their part of their e-commerce as well. So even when they are building new, they're building new with the plans of how do we integrate e-commerce in this. And when you're picking up farm feed off of an application off of your iPhone, <laughs> you know that e-commerce has become a much bigger part of everybody's, including companies that maybe traditionally people wouldn't have thought of uh, that have to have that and plan for that impact. So, And while we're there, mayors, I mean, it's probably safe to say a company like Farm and Fleet, and I've kind of followed it in, in the revolution, I mean, but but their product offerings, what they sell, is, is so dramatically oh, dramatic. more than yes. it was even five or ten mm-hmm. years ago. Because if I walked into a Farm and Fleet 20 years ago, you know, I was probably in Sycamore or DeKalb or a rural area, and, and you might be able to buy Carhartts back then, but be, but beyond that, you look at what their offerings are in the stores now, not only at, at the actual physical retail level, but the online level, and it, it amazes me of what they even need to do, and, and Frank knows that too well, because as you said, Uline started as you know, just boxes and tape and other things, and you grab that catalog now, and right. you know, it, it's unbelievable what that evolution's been from an offering standpoint. Right. I just want to say, Frank keeps saying he's not, not sexy, but you know, I got his catalog the other day. I joked with <laughs> him, you, and, I'm like, and I was pretty, exa- pretty excited about it. Uh, I told him uh, politicians use a lot, of, uh, a lot of their products to hand out literature throughout campaign season, so I told him I was pretty excited to get his catalog. So, And it, you know, I, I, it, well, you went up to one of our competitors, and I say competitors because Pleasant Prairie it really is one of our competitors. Sure. Uh, I talk about this often. Uh, you know, we don't look at our next door neighbors so much as we look at and, and the competitors within the region, uh, uh, but they do a great job out there. And, and you know, mm-hmm. in, in the, today, as a, as a municipality, you have to watch 
you know, communities that are in other markets in your immediate region and see what they're doing. And they do a great job up there. I, but if you ever do want to open another million square foot, <laughs> we, we got a spot for you. We'll save you one. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, <laughs> Kelly's happy to hear that I know that. And Mayor Dicker's happy to hear that is, you know, what we're promoting here is our region. And, and it's true. And, and, and you said it. Fact, fact is, fact is, you know, spot on. John is that, you know, it, it's about the region and those offerings because Pleasant Prairie really nowadays, in my mind, and being around it all the time, is a competitor of Romeoville, you know, in, in, to an extent. Um, uh, and, and, it's, and then it ends up being a lot about logistics, and, and mm -hmm. we kind of you know deal with that in general. But um, something that that Matt and I, because I was fortunate before Matt left Walmart and came to uh, JL, um, we we worked on a. A, what we call a, a sort facility for Walmart. So what I'm leading towards is there, there's kind of different types of even e-com real estate. As Merritt mentioned, and, and Frank talks about his, his big box network and how, how their logistics world works, but you know, you've got really multi-tiers of, of e-com. You've got you know, what we call a sort facility, pick and pack, where an Amazon has these drones that run around the floor and, and grab the, the one T-shirt you ordered with the one book you ordered, put it in a box, and send it out. That's a massive operation, massive undertaking. They, they, the, 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 before, they're, they're doing one down in Mantino, which is down 57 here, but they did you know, an Indianapolis-type facility of retrofit way back when. Up by Mayor Dick and Racine in Kenosha, they did a mega facility there um, that's kind of you know servicing Chicago and, and kind of the region b before Mantino gets open. You have the second type of real estate classification, um, which is more bulk, which uh, um, Mayor Noah mentioned, which is probably heavier you know bulk products, or the bulk stuff is supporting this small package operation. But then the third part, and, and this is part of the excitement I want, want Matt to talk about a little bit, is what we call last mile. And last mile is that, you know, when you talk about UPS and Fed, FedEx is making huge investments in their last mile systems uh, because it might get put into a box and shipped through a UPS channel uh, in 12 hours or whatever it might be. And you expect it as a prime customer or, you know, uh, the highest level of, of Walmart's e-com and, and, and their system in general, which we're all paying for, but it's got to get to your door. And, and that becomes what we call the last mod delivery system. So from a, a, re, from a, from a uh, um, real estate redevelopment standpoint, uh, whether it's in city or even, you know, kind of suburbia or, or more rural areas. Matt, can we talk about kind of that, that, that opportunity of, of last mile? Because it's a whole new, maybe smaller operation of a facility, but the importance of that in the overall supply chain, and, and there's a whole other evolution of that from a real estate perspective that's happening right now. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, so last mile, uh, over the last several years, really we've seen the growth of the true big box fulfillment centers, 500,000 million square foot facilities. I think there's still plenty of room to grow, uh, but last mile, that's kind of the next leg because um, <clears throat> what are the customer's expectations? More and more it's, I need it now, I need it now. I've got to have it as soon as possible. Uh, and, and what else do they want? They want free shipping, um, you know, just, a lot of factors just makes it hard for uh, retailers to, to make money and, and, and not take a loss on that. So what do you do? You, you get as close as possible to the population. Uh, real quick before I get into that, I just, you know, I think in light of everything that we're saying, I hope it's an encouragement uh, to, to you as a region to really be prepared for this, whether it's from uh, the, the labor perspective, whether it's from shovel ready, as, as the mayor and Frank mentioned, uh, being shelf ready, having your power requirements, because a lot of what these retailers are dealing with right now is they're already behind the eight ball. So as a region, as a region, thank you, uh, as a region uh, to be ready and prepared to have um, your, your land, your, your sites ready to show community, uh, retailers as they come into your community, that means a lot. reason I say that is because of the low hanging fruit theory. If your area is not prepared and ready to welcome a retailer in, because of this incredible demand uh, for e-commerce, they're going to go somewhere else where they can deliver quickly. So uh, j just being aware of that, being prepared for that, I think is a big thing. So ba back to the last mile. I mean, it really, the, the core of it is being as close as possible to a retail population, being within uh, downtown Chicago maybe, or, or at least on the periphery, so that 
um, you, you're able to, to get that within, a, get those deliveries in a couple of uh, couple hours if need be. The problem there is the limited development. So number one, you're not going to be able to get a 500,000 square foot building in downtown Chicago. It's just not going to happen. So then how do we get creative? A lot of these buildings that are open and available, functionally obsolete. Uh, they're not uh, immediately what a retailer is going to go in. It's you know, hey, maybe 20 foot clear, but is, is that going to work, the, the clear height? Um, so there, there's a lot of things to, to, to work around uh, to make it readily available for a retailer. I, I think what we're going to need to see in, in a lot of, uh, lot of areas is just a true partnership between retailers, between communities, between developers, uh, just coming together because, um, you know, unless they do that, it's just going to be hard to, to ultimately satisfy that in con consumer. If, if your rent, if a retailer's rent is so incredibly high to locate in the downtown area, you know, there's just so much pull, push and pull and opportunities for groups like this to get together and be inventive and say, how can we solve this? And, and, I, and I truly believe that that needs to be a partnership with those outside of this group, with the retailers and with, you know, local developers and things like that. Uh, but one of the things that you will see, just, just talking about what's in the box for that last mile, is, is really your high moving SKUs, your stock keeping units. Uh, what are going to be those items that, that you as the consumer in the downtown area want immediately? Mainly because you're limited in size and, and things like that. Uh, also, it's a, um, j just for the delivery, from a delivery standpoint, uh, you're, you're going to be able to want to be able to bundle as many things as possible in a box truck to go and deliver or, um, you know, if, if need be a car, but hey, stu stuff that car because the, as more efficient that you can be in delivery, the better. Um, but yeah, I, I can keep going. <laughs> I have, I have one more thought or question for Frank uh, is, is, you know, the business end of this. Uh, and then, please, we've got about 10 minutes left. And, Kelly, I'm watching the clocks. So we're staying ahead of the schedule. Um, uh, and then and I'll gladly open up to questions. But, Frank, something that, that always I always think about is that, you know, in your core business, not only does Uline have your own transportation fleet of trucks and, and you're operating them, and I see them all the time on 294 and, you know, 55 and other locations. And, and, and I travel a lot, so, so Uline is actually in L.A., they're in, you know, Atlanta, they're in Minneapolis, Chicago, and go down the list. Pretty good, Frank, that I actually know this stuff, Thank right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, but when you talk about also your partners in, in, in operations, so other, like, carriers like a FedEx or UPS and small package and kind of your e-com door-to-door delivery system, but also then in your bulk side of things of, of actually having to move your products to your warehouses after they're manufactured, that's one example of, of a challenge in the future that you're going to, you know, see. Or you talk about software systems, and you talked about them earlier, you know, of updating the technology all the time. Or we talk about job training, all these things. There, there's so many of these challenges beyond just the physicality of real estate and operations that you, that you face. So, I mean, what are you kind of seeing overall as, as a business in general, being on both sides of it, not only supply side, but also the, actually being an e-com company uh, of, of future challenges we're going to see in the near future? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Jim mentioned our traveling billboards, that we have uh, almost 1,000 trucks a day going up and down tollways, just like I-94, flashing the big U-line name next to them. But our secret is we actually aren't in the uh, shipping business. We outsource those, so all of our shipments are handled via third party. It's just if we grant business to these carriers on our behalf, we, as part of the arrangement, insist that they have nice tractors and trailers and put very crisp, clear, huge U-line lettering on their trailers. But our decision made early on is we're pretty good in distribution and we know how to distribute. We know nothing about freight and freight's a very difficult, challenging, tricky business. So we'll leave that to the experts. But if they're hauling our stuff full trailer loads day after day after day, we're sure going to use that as an opportunity to market. So what do I see as additional challenges? I mentioned technology, and I think Amazon has done a good job of kind of pressing the conversation there. Some of it gets chuckles. So they have Androids or various different devices trying to ultimately 
deliver their product. Maybe someday that'll happen, maybe that won't. They'll have driverless vehicles delivering their product. They'll have third-party individuals, a la Uber, as the final point of delivery to their end customer. We can say it makes sense, it doesn't make sense, we can chuckle, we can applaud them, but they're doing a nice job of really pressing the envelope of discussion around if minutes really do matter, how can we shave a few minutes and get your product to you more quickly because it seems that you really do want that. I know I do as a consumer, you probably do too. So how can we shave that? So I think technology is certainly one of those conversation points. And Amazon, as I said, is doing a great job of pushing that. I also think for anybody in this space, the billion dollar question is, how do you di differentiate yourself from Amazon? The numbers have already been tossed out. Amazon's in excess of 100 billion. It's a heck of a competitor. They're very good. So what is your value proposition as a company? Maybe it's private label. We've certainly relied heavily on that, stamping Uline on everything that we sell, although we don't make anything. But it all says Uline. The trailers say Uline. So are you branding? Are you using private label? I think a conversation point will also be, right now this space is very good at shipping a pen to you very quickly or a bottle of water to you very quickly, but who's going to excel at shipping bigger, bulkier things to you quickly? It's pretty easy to toss a pen into an Uber driver's car or UPS or FedEx and get it to you quickly, but will the market ultimately demand that you have a pallet jack or a pallet or warehouse racking shipped to you quickly? And what would that infrastructure look like to be able to accommodate that? And whoever might be able to excel in that space probably has a pretty unique competitive advantage. And I do think we've probably hit this too much this morning already, but this space is screaming for government and business and education to lock arms together mm -hmm. And the communities that do that the best will have a huge competitive advantage. Romeoville has done that exceptionally well. We mentioned Pleasant Prairie, for us, has done that exceptionally well. Speed does matter. And if somebody comes to you saying, I want to add a couple thousand jobs, I want to add a couple million square foot of warehouse space, if you say, I'll have it ready for you in a couple of years, that's not going to work. If you say, I'll work on developing workforce for you and develop relationships with the universities and that will be ready in three to five years. That's not going to work. If it's a business community that isn't unified with government, with education, then you're already way behind the opportunity. And I guarantee you somebody out there is just going to smoke right on by you and get that million square foot box while you're kind of looking around saying, well, I'm, I'm working on it. You know, do you have the shovel-ready sites? Do you have the infrastructure? Do you have the quick approvals? Do you have the unity in the business community? Do you have the mayor who knows the business intimately? Do you have education intertwined, ready to provide the workforce support? Those are things that I think are incumbent. It's, it's, if you can't even bring that to the table, you're not in the discussion. So once again, our message is you know, collaboration, and it's true. And, and, and I hear it more and more you know, nowadays, and it's, it's, it's a, a good kind of transition. We've got about five minutes left and, and would love to Open up for questions. There's probably more questions than I can get in five minutes, but we'll start right in the front here. Uh, I think that while we're all trying to catch up with the e-commerce model of Amazon, uh, we need to be very uh, cognizant of the fact they've already rebranded even e-commerce to include e-services. Just last week, I received a lengthy list of services, everything they'd like to do everything from send someone to hang my Christmas lights to fix my plumbing. So since in southeast Wisconsin, we already have a, a challenge to our workforce because so many of the big boxes are built along interstates, but the workforce is located inland and has a transportation issue, what's going to happen um, to a lot of our traditional workforce? Force as is it going to be like the Borg? Is it just assimilation? Or what is it going to look like um, when every traditional job can now be something that with a click of a button um, has become an e-commerce model? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, there's a, a number of things that they're going to, and there's any number of 
you know, other retailers are delving into an, any number of different other issues. Uh, yeah, it all ties into ultimately in all, all those same questions. Um, uh, but uh, you know, you want to add anything? Well, I would just say it, it is somewhat similar from from what I understand to the Amazon marketplace. So what that actually is is not Amazon that's selling you the items. It's still it's you from your garage that's selling this item through Amazon. So I believe the services is not Amazon. I mean, it is local plumbers that have gone with the platform of Amazon to help market their services. Now, I could be wrong about that, but go ahead. And, and actually, it, it kind of leads into, actually, one, the point I wanted to make as well as we, as we look at practices going in the future, we are a lot of focus, again, on the big box, uh, you know, but taking Amazon as an example, and this the service side, but also in, on, on the, the products they sell, you know, Amazon does a lot of fulfillment for third-party fulfillment for other retailers, other e-commerce retailers. You know, and I think as we look at if you're in the hub of a, in proximity of a major Amazon facility, you need to think about how can you create new economic opportunities with these third-party retailers. Uh, e -re you know, e retailers that may be part of the, their system, and they may need smaller facilities. And this also goes into a kind of the overall discussion too. Is you know, in infrastructure, not only is it energy and transportation, but and it goes back to the service side for your residents is the connectivity of your community. You know, are you fiber ready? Are you going to be a fiber? You know, I, I'm ha I'd be happy to report right now. We're going to be with within the end of next year. We'll be one of the first communities fully fiber to every house, every building, every retail establishment will have fiber, fully fiber op options. Not everybody can say that today. And it's something that we need to plan for and we need to be aggressive about uh, so you can capitalize on those other economics so that the smaller operations that may want to partner with Amazon can arise and so you have local, maybe you have, you have entrepreneurs in your community that want to be partners with them, but want to be a third party uh, e-retailer, but you have to create a system which that allows them to invest and to capitalize on that as well. And that's, that's part of it. You talk about in job opportunity creation is that if you, if you go to Dick's Sporting Goods tomorrow and buy a basketball pole for your, you know, your driver for the kids, they'll have a, an outsourced service come dig a hole, pour the concrete, and put the pole up for you for, for an additional charge. So it, it becomes a whole other layer of, of logistics in, in, in that, you know, from, from that perspective. If you go to Home Depot and order a Weber grill, they'll come and assemble it for you for a fee. They're not doing that, the retailer, but they're partnering with, you know, the, the local whatever it might be or carpentry work, whatever it might be. So, so that, that also hopefully brings in a whole other opportunity of, of job and, 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 you know, career creation for, for what's happening in the econ world in general. I thought, yes. Hi, uh, is this working here? I'm on. Uh, Bill Tester, the Federal Reserve Bank. I'd kind of like to expand on that question a bit and also compliment you on really giving us an education of the extent of this phenomena and what we need to do to accommodate e-commerce so that we're a successful region. But uh, I'm not sure that, you know, you're, you're probably the people to answer this, but I think we all need to think about it uh, for what we do here is that we're talking about a lot greater road use because of this, this model. Uh, we've just had an advisory referendum in Illinois that suggested that we wanted to earmark our meager road use taxes to building out the infrastructure, and that might be helpful in one option. But uh, to the extent that we have a greater demand now on our road use capacity, uh, we need to think about are we pricing this uh, correctly? If we build a capacity for what you'd need, and it might be that we really overbuild, uh, Amazon and so forth might be subsidizing uh, because it's a lost leader to build out their network. To build a capacity might be very, very expensive, too expensive for our region in terms of what we'll lose in getting people to work, uh, getting our office workers and so forth and other things we might overbuild in this, in this uh, arena, or otherwise we'll have congestion, which is the same problem. So I think as a region, what we need to do is think about how to most intelligently accommodate this new phenomenon because we do want our stuff at our door in a very timely fashion, but we also have a lot of other land use needs and uh, road use transportation needs as well. So uh, this is something I think we'll need to be thinking about uh, very hard going forward. Thank you for that thought. So yeah, we're, we're about out of time. Um, I know the mayor's got a busy, busy schedule ahead, but I'm gonna be here all day. Matt, be around for a bit. You know, Frank, I think we're more than welcome to have you for, I know you drove a long way to get here, but, uh, but we're around and, and 
See, I told you, Kelly, we'd have no problem filling the hour. So, but thank you, everybody. Let's give a great hand.